And welcome back to the Illuminations Media Network. I'm your host, Tamara Tiesi, and I'm so excited to bring this exciting guest today. I'm glad you joined us because we are going to be talking about some very deep topics. Susan B. Martinez, Ph.D., has earned her doctorate in anthropology at Columbia University, where she also served as lecturer in ethnolinguistics. She is the book review editor at the Academy of Spiritual and Consciousness Studies and the author of The Psychic Life of Abraham Lincoln, The Hidden Prophet, Time of the Quickening, and The Lost History of the Little People. A contributor for Forbidden Science and Dark Lore, her work also appears in Atlantis Rising, Fate, and the New Dawn magazine. We have so much to talk about and share. We'll be right back with Susan B. Martinez after this brief message. What is Gaim TV? Gaim TV brings you streaming videos specifically curated to inspire, educate, and transform yourself. From energizing yoga classes, you don't focus on what holds you back, you focus on what's already there, to inspiring documentaries. We started this film by asking what's wrong with the world, and we ended up discovering what's right with it. And cutting-edge presentations. We're pushed by pain until we're pulled by a vision. Gaim TV reveals new and enlightening perspectives for our changing world. You realize it's something that organically unfolds from the field of your own being. We're in the middle of a a very profound shift in the way that we perceive ourselves. Enjoy unlimited access to our exclusive library anytime, anywhere. You will accomplish so much more if you're happy. Gaim TV, videos to transform your mind, body, and soul. And we're back on the Illuminations Media Network with Susan Martinez. Susan, welcome to Illuminations. Hi, Tamara. I'm so glad you could join us. You know, I am a huge fan. There's a brand new book, The Mysterious Origins of Hybrid Man, Crossbreeding, and the Unexpected Family Tree of Humanity. Now, you know that book opens up all kinds of old crates and (laughs) boxes of worms, things that people may not want to look at because it's definitely uh, poking at their belief systems. Well, Susan, since you're new to the Illuminations family, before we get into these deep topics, I would love for you to share a bit about yourself with our listeners and a bit about your passion. Well, uh, <laughs> I don't really know what to say except that I'm a full-time writer. I'm, I'm an independent. I, I, I got my training a hundred years ago in uh, academics, and I, I dropped out uh, very early on uh, as, uh, after teaching for two years and have been uh, free of that ever since. So, you know, I'm an independent scholar then, so I can do what I want, and I, I'm not beholden to the paradigm that is taught and insisted on uh, in the ivory tower well that's exactly why we have you here because <laughs> this, is <all> about, <laughs> this is all about being rogue and maverick we don't want to be beholding to agreed upon stories especially if they're not true now Susan as an anthropologist you understand about science and about finding things that are actual, factual, and real, stuff that's tangible. And in your book, I have to say you have painstakingly given us the evidence as well as pulling up evidence and connecting it with an ancient book, a book that I've never heard of, the Hoaspi, that points to a lot of these these hidden stories, this hidden information about the the human family tree. And there's so much to go into. I don't know where to begin. So let's start with that missing link. We always hear about that missing link. 
you know there's this this path to our development and our progress as beings but then all of a sudden we've got this spark please share that well um this is a matter of uh, rethinking the whole story that we've been told uh, uh, first of all that we uh, evolved uh, from apes you know uh, they never did uh, find the missing link between ape and man but uh, what I'm doing is um, uh, entirely dismissing that possibility and instead presenting uh, actually presenting the little people as uh, the true uh, missing link to give them a scientific name they would be called Homo sapiens pygmaeus, the uh, pygmy people. Uh, that is what is missing in all of our work and in all of our studies of man's past. It, there was a, uh, a developed sort of uh, humanity very, very early on. Uh, so, and in that sense also, we never did evolve. Uh, the races on earth just crossbred and all the different types came about that way. Interesting. Now, you mentioned the pygmies, the little people. In all cultures all over the world, you hear stories about the little people. You know, whether it's the, the pygmies in Africa, you certainly hear about leprechauns and fairies uh, from Europe. And even in Hawaii, you hear about the Menahuni. Now, tell me about these little folks and how they would be that missing link. Well, uh, I see the uh, books now as a series. I, I didn't conceive it that way, but that's just how they have turned out. Uh, the one previous to uh, Hybrid Man, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, was called the lost history of the little people, uh, and that go that at book length uh, answers your question. But uh, by the time I was finishing writing that book, uh, I realized that uh, the hottest topic of all was uh, evolution and how how the races came about and where they where they came from. Uh, but in the Little People book, I just concentrated on establishing them as a true uh, proto-historical race. Uh, I didn't get into the uh, issues of uh, Darwin and evolution. And at that point, I realized I had to write another book to do that. So I did that in the present book that we're talking about, The Mysterious Origins of Hybrid Man. And there's going to be one more in the series. There's going to be a third to complete the series, and that's the one I'm working on now. Uh, and it's about the land of Pan. It's about the lost continent in the uh, Pacific Ocean. And that will complete uh, the picture for, for the way I want to uh, talk about uh, uh, proto-history and uh, antiquities. Um, the little people uh, were here almost from the beginning, uh, and they lived, and they were anatomically modern. Uh, they were only they were very very short, three feet three feet tall. Uh, they lived side by side with the most primitive uh, uh, version of man, which uh, is um, known basically by the name of Australopithecus or Artipithecus, uh, those are their scientific names, uh, pretty primitive, uh, sloping forehead, no chin, barrel chest, long arms, uh, large flat feet, uh, the entire gestalt of uh, primitive morphology, which means anatomy. They were here on earth, but they uh, coexisted with the little people who were of the modern type. Uh, and although these races were supposed to remain apart, they didn't. They mingled. 
um, and they produced uh, a new kind of man uh, that is known in the record as Homo erectus, kind of a mixture of the primitive, kind of a mixture of primitive and uh, modern features and so on and so on with races continually mixing up to the present day, up to the present moment. And so uh, race mixing is the story of man, not evolution. Beautiful. Now, certainly there is that creation part, and we'll get to back back in a little bit later. But right now, I would love to get into, you know, who these little people were and if there was no evolution, how did the different types or races of, of man, if you will, appear on the planet? By, uh, hybr- uh, by hybrid mixes. And so they were hybridized and mixed, so one type combined with another. And certainly there was similarity or else they wouldn't have been able to reproduce. The uh, uh, Ihens, which is the uh, original name of the little people, were the high the high type, the advanced type, a uh, prominent nose, a uh, prominent brow, a uh, well-formed chin, short arms, uh, symmetry of body form, uh, and good brain. Uh, they lived side by side with the most primitive type of man, the type that lived in the trees and sometimes scampered along on uh, all fours. Uh, but there were mixings, and that's how... Uh, the uh, next type of race came about. And that's how all the races came about, through mixings and crossbreeding. Right. And so in the very beginning, um, there's, a, there's a story in the Oaspe that speaks about how, how the human-like form even showed up here, um, that there was that, the, the sons of God that came down it's such a, a beautiful story that that I, I know our listeners can probably visualize as as you share it. So I'd love it if you would go into that. Uh, every uh, myth, every mythology in the world, well, I shouldn't say every, but uh, you find this everywhere. You find this on a universal basis. The mythology is talking about uh, their... Uh, divine ancestors who came down from the sky. Uh, In Greek mythology, uh, it's Zeus who comes down and uh, lays with a mortal woman and uh, produces uh, Perseus or whatever hero it was who came came of the match. Uh, In primitive mythology as well, you have uh, the uh, forefathers uh, coming about by means of the mixture of heaven and earth. That's how it is in uh, all these cases. Heaven and earth uh, laid together and produced man. Uh, For the American Indians, it's star woman came down. Uh, You find it in Australia. You find it everywhere. Um, And this is where you have to say that uh, myth is not always true to fact uh, in every sense, but there's there is a kernel of, of truth in mythology, particularly when you find it uh, cross-culturally or on a universal basis. So many people from so many different places telling the same story. Uh, so this is the baseline I use in trying to uh, tell the story of the uh, Ihens, the little people, how they came to Earth. And it was a similar uh, scenario. There were uh, beings who were asked, uh, spirit, spirit beings who were asked uh, to come to Earth to help uplift um, the uh, those ground people who were scampering around on all fours and swinging in the trees, and they did not have uh, the uh, soul developed either. They were kind of uh, animal men, but they were men, but they were animal men in his lowest form. Uh, So the gods uh, asked for volunteers, and they did come, and uh, as teachers, but again, they, uh, having taken on corporeal bodies, uh, they were tempted, and they mixed, 
with the ground people and the product, the offspring, was the little people. That's fascinating. And uh, that certainly, you know, ties some uh, loose ends together in my mind. And I know that I'm going to get a lot of good responses from our listeners. Uh, now, we think about uh, Zechariah Sitchin's work and uh, how he talks about uh, the watchers, you know, connecting uh, those, those tablets there from Samaria with uh, the Book of Enoch, that you had the watchers that fell down from heaven and they, they mixed and they created these children. Now, in the story that you're sharing from the Oaste, was there anger, was there contention uh, or punishment for mixing and creating these little people? Uh, many traditions that uh, say that, that the flood was brought about as a uh, punishment for sinful mankind. Uh, but I disagree with that. Um, mm. I do agree that uh, the flood was caused by the gods, and that's also a statement made in many traditions. I agree with that, but not from anger. You see, the good gods, there are good gods and false gods. That's the first thing we have to uh, realize. But the good gods who did uh, uh, create uh, the conditions for the flood that's my next book, sorry. Um, okay, they did not uh, do it in any wrath or anger or as punishment. Uh, the idea was to uh, break up uh, the uh, negative spirits that were accumulated and anchored in the heavens of the earth. And that could only be done by uh, uh, finding where they congregate and destroying that area. Uh, and it so happens uh, that now we're getting into a whole different topic. Do you want to get into it? Oh, please. <laughs> I love it. We're going back 24,000 years here. We're going back to histories that I did find revealed in OASPE. Uh, and then, you know, go on to see how much this could be corroborated. In any case, uh, I date the flood as 24,000 years ago. And I place it not in uh, the Atlantic Ocean, but in the Pacific Ocean, the huge, empty Pacific. You know, that's one-third of the uh, Earth's surface. Something right. is missing there. It's right. the continent of Pan. Um, okay, this all ties in with those gods who were not wrathful but needed to uh, break up the uh, monopoly of uh, negative spirits that were uh, on the earth. Let me tell you what happened before 24,000 years ago. Uh, okay. The good people who were uh, known as, as the um, sacred little people had been exterminated uh, in every place in the world by the uh, larger tribes. They, they might come down in tradition as uh, giants. They had been exterminated. They the last remnant of them was on the continent of Pan in the Pacific, and they were hiding out from their persecutors. Uh, but because of their constant communion uh, with their spirit, spirit mentors, uh, they learned of the coming uh, destruction, and they were uh, instructed to build ships to escape it, uh, which they did, and they did escape. Uh, but the continent itself was torn asunder. Very interesting. So that, that takes us to the, the story of, uh, of Noah and the Great Flood and the survivors. That's which, exactly right. Yeah. Little, Noah, Noah's tribe were the little people. Ah. Okay, now that's a story that's shared all over the globe. By every tradition, there's always a flood and a few survivors. Very fascinating. Now, when, when we think about the flood, we, we certainly realize that there was a new beginning after that. And, and you talk about the continent of Pan. What does that tie in when we think about Atlantis, Lumeria, and Mu? Um. 
I'm writing about that right now, and that's a book that'll probably be out in 2015. And my title for it is The Land of Pan. Um, I devote one chapter in that book to um, dissing Atlantis <laughs> um, because it gets all the uh, attention, and I, I think it's it's large faulty uh, history. Uh, whereas I, uh, I think the key story is in the lost lands of the Pacific, which is known as Lemuria, but that's another term um, I pick apart and decide not to use because it's been largely confused with lost lands in in the uh, Indian Ocean. So I'm not using Lemuria, I'm not using Atlantis, I'm focusing strictly on pan, and uh, that's how uh, we can trace the early histories. We're going back uh, 24,000 years there. We're going into the um, Mesolithic period long before the Neolithic and the uh, end of the uh, Pleistocene. And uh, the um, what is key here is that the uh, little people uh, sailed away from Pan in five separate fleets. And each of those fleets went to a different part of the world. Uh, and it served a purpose because they were just barbarians in e every part of the world at that point. Man had uh, regressed from a higher state. They, they had exterminated the little people. Um, so as they settled in each of these five, five regions, China, India, Japan, America, and Africa, uh, they again crossbred with the indigenous people and produced uh, more, more new, new races. But none of that is evolution. It's just interbreeding. Now, a lot of our listeners uh, have sent me emails and questions uh, to the regard of star seeding that you know as you mentioned earlier there were you know um, spirit beings who who asked to come and to elevate the the planet to to help to uh, create a more prosperous and intelligent and conscious species on the planet but were there different um, different races from different planets that seeded, and that's why we come in different colors with different features? Uh, that's a, a distinct uh, possibility. Yeah, because I never bought into the story that someone could walk out of Africa, and then over time, uh, the skin tone changes, the facial features, and uh, the structure of the hair changes. <laughs> I, yeah, I never really bought into that yeah and that's what we're taught and that's what textbooks say but it's false and we need to understand what the true history is right and that's why what you're doing is so very important have you gotten any flack from the scientific uh, the scientific structures the powers that be for your work you know the powers that be are silent all I'm hearing is from people like you, you know, how it's helping them uh, with stuff that they always thought but, uh, you know, didn't know how to pin it down. Um, I've been getting very good feedback, but silence. And, you know, when I, 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 I have even contacted a few people, you know, professionals in paleoanthropology, and <laughs> they don't answer me. They don't want, they, I'm their worst nightmare. <laughs> well, you know what that means. That means that you are definitely on to something. And I can feel it, you know, deep down in my spirit. Uh, when I when I first opened this book, and I'm so grateful to have a copy, um, it just resonated with me on so many different levels. And, and you know what, Tamara? It wouldn't hurt a paleontology to adopt the uh, hybrid model because then they could go back to work and figure out which race is mixed with which other races and they could still do their things and their charts and their textbooks and their lectures. Um, right. It just is a matter of dumping, dumping Darwin 
which is the only 19th century theory we still uh, uh, embrace. Everything else we've, we've uh, surpassed. And why do you think that that's holding on so steadily? I know why. Because Darwin fits in with the secular paradigm, the godless paradigm, and it's the only way to explain uh, the appearance of mankind on this earth by uh, uh, arguing for evolution, evolving. Um, the opposite view of that is creationism. Right. Uh, and uh, they, they have been locking horns for a long time. Uh, it's not only in Darwinism, but it's in every field of knowledge where a, a secular explanation is required. But I believe the truth lies in a combination of the scientific and spiritual point of view. That's right. There's always three stories, right? As they say, his story, her story, and the truth. <laughs> so, All right. Many, many different perspectives. Now, I would like to touch on, you know, in the few minutes we have left for the, uh, the first half, uh, just to touch on a little bit about the idea of uh, out of Africa. You know, there's a, there's a lot of information that, that certainly points to the fact that mankind um, first sprang out of Africa and then began to spread and move from there. Yeah, uh, I had to devote a separate chapter to that subject, uh, chapter 11, and it turned out to be the longest uh, chapter. Um, uh, out of Africa, the African Garden of Eden um, is, has become a strict part of the Darwinian uh, paradigm. Uh, this is the, uh, where uh, the professors and experts tell us that all mankind came from, came from Africa. Uh, I don't believe this is true. Um, the, uh, one of the first things I look at is the fact that uh, Louis Leakey uh, began digging uh, in Africa in the early 1900s, and he was one of the first to find uh, early man. That's the um, ground people I was talking about, Australopithecus uh, type. Uh, in Africa. And so uh, the generations of uh, students followed Leakey into Africa, uh, digging more digging and finding more Australopithecus and getting all these fossil men and putting the whole story together and deciding that man came out of Africa. Well, um, that's where they went. That's where they dug. Of course they were going to find it. You know, a generation or two before Leakey, uh, everybody all the experts were saying man came out of Asia. So uh, this is only about 25 years ago that the African uh, Garden of Eden, the African Eve, uh, became popular and became a fixed idea uh, in uh, Darwinian evolutionism. Uh, but it's, it's not true. And as you say, uh, it would be impossible for the African to migrate out and go to Sweden and turn white, to go to China and turn yellow. Those are fairy tales that they're still teaching in school. Right. And, and as you say, the bottom line is that the only thing that can make a change to someone's uh, innate nature, the physicality of, of skin color, eye color, hair texture, uh, body type, is mixing. Yes, and that's exactly how the story has to be told. Ah, a lot of people uh, get upset about that idea. Even well, <laughs> because then, because the bottom line, Tamara, is the yeah. secular paradigm versus the uh, spirit, spiritual one. And eventually we're going to have to come around to uh, reconciling those two. Uh, we, we're not animals. We're spiritual beings in corporeal bodies. Right. Right. We're a combination of both. So, again, uh, we are all a result of mixing, intermingling here. 
And, uh, it's and it's hoping- called the nookie factor. I got that term from an archaeologist friend of mine. He calls it sex in the single species. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So it's time for everybody to just begin to wake up. You know, we cannot, uh, even modern man, no one can say, I am all anything. We are a, a mixed race on the planet, and we're becoming more mixed by the moment. <laughs> so exactly. everyone needs to wake up and, uh, and stop all this bickering and divisiveness. It's definitely a tool of those who want to dominate and control us. That's mm-hmm. what it's about. Isn't it? Well, this is the end of our first half here on Blog Talk Radio. I thank you so much for listening to us here on Illuminations Media Network. I'm Tamara Tayesi, your host, and you've been listening to Susan Martinez. Please join us in the members section for our second half, where we can go into some deeper details about the many gardens of Eden. We're going to go into white supremacy and Afrocentric point of view. We're also going to talk about Sitchin and the Anunnaki. So we'll see you there. If you're not a member, sign up at the IlluminationsMedia.net website. Take good care and thank you so much for joining us. Peace and blessings.